All right, Elena. So Elena asks, dogs with noise phobias. How to correct dogs with extreme anxiety who do not appear food motivated? Are dogs afraid of anything that beeps? This is generalized to all sounds that slightly resemble this noise. Trucks, cars, airplanes, clicks, high-pitched sounds on the TV, microwave, etc. When he hears any of these things, or anything of this nature, he will hide in the closet and have a complete panic attack. We have not figured out anything that can snap him out of this or distract him. Even his favorite things, meeting new people, fresh meat, they make zero difference to him. Any suggestions? All right, so... (laughs) Josh, would you like to reiterate my answer? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, boy. God, I'm in a sassy mood right now. <laughs> so um, basically what we got into as far as the answer for this is anytime we're dealing with a dog like this, right, the very mm. first thing that we need to do and we need to look at is we need to essentially recalibrate what our expectations are, right? So when we're dealing with a dog like this, I would consider this a dog that's extremely, extremely like neurologically impaired, right? They have, um, they have limitations as far as how far they're going to get with things. And the first thing I look at when I see this is I look at having a conversation with an owner as far as no matter what you do, you're not going to get the dog to not be anxious of this kind of stuff. The dog will always have a phobia of these types of things. Now, that's okay because we can define success in other ways. And mm-hmm. as we do that, we can start to push that needle in the direction of getting the dog better and getting the dog past these different things. Yep. So I use an example of a client I was working with yesterday. His name is Jack. Jack is a German Shepherd Husky mix that I would say teeters on the edge of being one of the most like high energy dogs that I have worked with in a very, 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 very long time. And I would say he's almost on caliber, like with my dog, Vinny, who I've talked about many times, who is, in my opinion, one of the highest drive dogs that I've worked with, right? And one of our first conversations that we had together, or we were having a conversation yesterday, actually, where she had mentioned that you know, she was really happy that her training approach was a little bit more individualized to her dog, where a Mm -hmm. a training program she had done beforehand uh, was not so much that. It was very much the, like, you have to do it this way, and the dog is expected to perform exactly like this, and if the dog is not doing it that way, the dog's doing it wrong, and you're doing something wrong, and you need to do that, and it needs to look like this, or else you're not doing it right, Mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, when you're dealing with dogs that have learning impairments, right, or have uh, extreme arousal issues or, or limitations with certain things, your success has to look different, right? With Jack, with all of his high energy that he has, we need to define that success is not going to be the calm, slow, focused in, compliant, this, that dog that you could picture in your head of like what a real dog should look like, right? Because this dog is not that. This dog has different needs and different energy levels and uh, you need to be accommodating of that. So the first thing we looked at with him, like on like session two, where we started to redefine the success was his healing, right? Because he was such a forward moving, high drive, jacked up, amped up dog, nothing we were going to do was going to get him to stay like perfectly behind us. Mm -hmm. And using Vinny as an example, Vinny was very similar with his healing because of how high energy he was. He never, and I tried for years to kind of fight with him and get him to be the dog that would like walk behind me you know and stay really far back and stuff because of his drive and his energy he had i would say he wound up being a kind of center of the body glued to the leg kind of dog with his Mm -hmm. healing and to some people that's not what heel should be right so what happens is you wind up nagging the dog and fighting with them just having this battle with them over and over again to try to get them to do something that they're just not going to do you know and jack is very similar to that he's a dog that he you know, same deal, walks slightly ahead. But if you look at that slightly ahead as the boundary and, you know, something to maintain, he does it virtually perfectly. So because of that, once you redefine the successes, your healing can look like this. And as long as you do this, you're doing it correctly. You've immediately found success. You've immediately created less frustration in your communication with the dog. You've become more okay with it because you understand that that's actually okay that he does it like that. And what happens is because you create less stress, the dog actually starts doing it better in the first place. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of this big cycle. If you redefine what it should look like. And once you hit that point and the dog starts performing correctly and the dog understands we're happy with this, you start start understanding you're happy with this 
everybody starts getting better and smoother over time because of that, yeah. right? So going back to the actual question here with the noise phobias, right? The second that you could create that expectation in your head of the anxiety will always be there. The dog will still always have some degree of a quote-unquote panic attack over this kind of stuff probably. Mm -hmm. Then you could start looking at the issue, which is not the anxiety, and it's not the panic attack, and it's not the going in the closet. Because frankly, I don't care if the dog does any of those things. Would I like them to be a little more confident? Sure, right? But I don't care if they do all of those things from the standpoint of this exact question. What the issue actually is, is when the dog gets into this state of mind and goes and hides in the closet or goes and has a panic attack or whatever it is, you've lost complete control over the dog. And because you've lost complete control over the dog, you have no ability to help them through these situations. They're essentially yeah. just sitting in their head, just cycling, 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 freaking out, freaking out, freaking out, right? Yeah. So how do we go about working through these things? Step number one, as with everything, training, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how does training correlate into this? Training gives us a clear expectation, right? So you could teach X number of things, a come command, a down command, a bed command, whatever it may be. And once you have those things taught and you have an ability to be able to enforce those things, you could start implementing those things into difficult situations, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case... Beeping starts, dog freaks out, dog goes and hides in the closet, right? What's everybody's first instinct when I say use a command to get them out of it? They walk up, they go, come, come on, bud. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Hey, yeah. come here. Hey, I know you're scared. <laughs> come on, let's go. And then you go pet them and then you try to coax them through it and you do all this like little soft stuff. And none of that, all of that is doing is catering to the fear, yeah. right? All that is doing yeah. is saying, I know something scary right now, but yeah, yeah I'm going to, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to reinforce it, right? I like what that you give you? them a Mickey Mouse voice when they do that. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> is, that is that how it goes? Something yeah, like that. something like that. <laughs> so what do you actually need to do in this scenario? And this is where everybody gets on me over being like insensitive over this stuff because there's all this talk out there right now of counter conditioning and creating a positive association with things and stuff like that. And again, when you get into dogs that have true neurological conditions like this, you're not going to create a positive association with these things. Yeah. It will not happen. Dogs that have such deep-rooted fears and anxieties like this over irrational things like this, mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't automatically become positive. No amount of treats or cookies or she said fresh meat yeah. is going to help the dog through these scenarios, right? Yeah. So here's what you do. You take a command that you have taught really well. Let's say come dog's in the closet over there, right? You give your cum command, right? The second the dog does not comply with it, you don't go pet them or give the command again or try to coax them out of it. You give a firm correction for non-compliance of the command, right? Mm -hmm. And that is essentially you're like, whack, snap out of it, right? Because here's what's mm -hmm. happening. The dog's freaking out. Oh my God, I'm panicked. Oh my God, there's a noise out there. Oh my God, I'm panicked. Oh, I know they're calling me, but I'm not listening because I'm panicked. And then what happens? They get the correction. They're like, oh my God, I'm panicked. I'm panicked. Whoa. Right, And it just snaps them out of it real quick because you have to make them care more about the consequence you're giving than that fear that's going on in their head. Yep. Right, And the first time is going to be the hardest because the dog is freaking mm -hmm. out and they're so used to that closet or that situation being their safe spot. And you need to teach them, no, I need you to pay attention to me right now. Right. And the second you adopt that leadership mentality and you work your dog through that scenario, no questions asked. You have to be compliant in this situation because I know and I'm telling you that there's nothing scary going on right now. And as your leader, I need you to trust me through this so I can work you through it. You're mm -hmm. finally going to start to get some headway with it because the dog is going to go from having 100% of their brain cycling through in an anxious state and super concerned and fixated on whatever's happening in this noise or in this closet or whatever it may be to 25% of their brain is then focused on you. To the mm -hmm. next time you go work on it and you give another correction for it, 50% of their brain is focused on you. To 75% of their brain is focused on you. To the point where you get them to where such a small percentage of their brain is even concerned with those noises because they know, I know this thing is kind of scary to me, but I know that I have to listen to him still or I need to listen to her still or I need to listen to anybody still in this situation yeah. so that I could start to help them through this stuff. Mm. And... Man, is that the hard stuff because that's where you start getting into what the dog needs, not what the dog wants, or yeah, not what the dog wants or what the human yeah. wants. Oh, that was another point with the daycare that I was talking about before is I talked about the idea of 
the 12 hour days and how uh, everybody yeah. wants that typical daycare kind of setting yeah. and everybody wants for it to be like this, like we're running and playing and there's there, I'm in this pack of uh, all these dogs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting into again, what the dog actually needs to thrive is more important than what the owner wants for the dog because everybody wants to say this is what my dog does. Mm -hmm. But what they actually need is one-on-one -on -one social time. What they actually need is structure. What they actually need is training in those situations. Yeah. So going back to the daycare setting, that is what we're kind of shifting towards is we're trying to create something like that with the enrichment, which with the training and with the more smaller individualized one-on-one -on -one socialization groups. So anyways... <laughs> <laughs> Quick plug. Quick plug. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you get into what the dog needs in that situation. It is what the dog needs in that situation is far greater than what our emotions want in that situation. Yes. What our emotions want is for our dog to have a positive association yep. or for them to come out for a treat and everything to be okay and better. But this gets into just like with kids, sometimes you have to have the tough conversation with your dog. Mm -hmm. And that is what I would consider to be the tough conversation with your dog where yeah. your dog is freaking out and they're scared and you want it to be okay and you want to make it okay for them. Yeah. But that's the only way you're going to do it. You got to snap them out of it. You got to get them refocused in because in the end of the day, dogs only understand one of two things when we like what they're doing and when we don't like what they're doing. Yep. And the sooner people start realizing that and there's no gray in between and you start understanding what you really have to do sometimes. Yeah. And you got to step to the plate. Yeah. Get past it. Be the leader. Be the leader your dog needs. All right.